Black Hearts Bay, map number one, and well, boy, have we a lot to talk about. Uh, we have the final match in Group A, now that's the first one. Whichever team wins here moves on to the final phase of the tournament. The loser is out. So we are in the group stage, we have two groups with four teams each, and this is the final match out of Group A. We're in the Banshee Cup, season number two, and thanks to Psykiv, thanks to Kevin, we have $2,500 in prize money that gets split into 1500 for the top three teams and a thousand for the bounty pool and we're going to come back to that but hopefully if you watch this match here yeah, you've already watched a couple of the games of the banshee cup and you know what the bounties are and how the bounty pool works but if not i'll explain it later but this is an interesting one it's a very interesting one for multiple reasons now first of all these two teams have already met so they played in the first round of the group stage they played the first match and lopaka's team won with a 3-1 score now it's a rematch and everything is on the line here so who's gonna take it here we'll find out there's also a couple a little bit of drama that we have to talk about so if you remember in the first match that they played we had play sub in for team de quasa and there was a little bit of a question hey is he even allowed to sub in because he was part of a team before but then basically the admins talked to everybody and was like, oh, okay, you got removed from the team, so now he is in the player pool and he can sub in. Now, there was a little bit of drama surrounding all of this and a bit of miscommunications between some of the teams and the admins and then back and forth. But after the last play day ended, they sussed everything out. And now what apparently happened, and this is unfortunately not really great news, so Play with his initial team, according to what I was told, was actually griefing the team quite a bit muted himself fully in uh, uh, Discord, didn't participate in voice, and essentially just was griefing his team. And so the team said like, hey, pff, the guy is sabotaging everything here, so we're gonna kick him out. And then play was, so to say, free to sub for other teams and wanted to take advantage of that. And the admins, when they heard that story, were first like, excuse me, what? <laughs> and yeah, he got now kicked out of the tournament he's not allowed to sub in for anybody anymore and will not be subbing in this tournament so yeah a little bit of drama surrounding all of that so some of the details i mean players themselves might fill you in on that but that's at least all the details that i so far have been told but of course a bit overshadowing that now in this case they're playing with ion again which is their main roster so we got Blaze and Diablo now for the team. We got Rega here too. And then over on the other side, Team Lopaka, who've already played a couple of games here today with uh, Hirath that's locking the Haka in. And we're having Hunter Orc on right wing as we're heading into game number one. Now I've been also talking a little bit already about the bounties, of course. And just to reiterate that real quickly, bounties are listed as follows. And if you complete a bounty, you get a ticket for that bounty pool. I pointed out earlier that we have $1,000 in that bounty pool and the bounty pool is going to be shared accordingly to how many bounties were completed by each team. So if you complete more and more bounties as a team, you get a larger share of the, out of that bounty pool at the end of the tournament. And if you complete no bounties whatsoever, then obviously you get nothing. So teams always have to make that risk reward calculation if they want to give themselves a bit of a handicap in order to get potentially more money at the end of the tournament. If they want to play one of these things and test it out, or if they're just saying like, yeah, not really, it's too much of a risk for us. We just want to play a straight up game and want to win there. So that's kind of what's happening around the bounties. We could see some being completed here. The teams in question have already completed multiple bounties. So they could add additional tickets if they really wanted to. We get Mirrodin, we get Grey Main as our next pick here on Black Hearts Bay in the best of five. And yeah, so we have actually a lot of CC already with Mirrodin, Poly, with Tehaka's Tong. You can very quickly get a CC chain going that Grey Main can capitalize on as well. And the next double pick is going to finalize what kind of heroes we're getting for Team De Quasa. Now you could also try and play on the global side a bit with Falstad and use him as a disengage. Black Hearts Bay was always a bit of an odd one because you technically don't even have to fight on this map in order to win. We have them now with Cassia and Genji for damage. So it looks certainly like we're going to get quite some fights. But you also want to have some heroes that can go for the small pirate camps so that you get additional doubloons and can start turning them in. It's a fairly amusing map. Can be kind of entertaining. I think from all of the weirdo maps that we put in every now and then, Haunted Mine surprised me the most because it's fairly viable. But here comes the final pick, and it's Lopaka with Malthale. Ladies and gentlemen, the stage is set. Let's go. Map number one, Blackheart's Bay. 
Game number one. It is the final series in Group A. And on the left side, we have Dequaza on Blaze, Madara on Cassia, playing from North America here on the European server. So definitely a bit of a ping disadvantage for him. Gamer Boy on Rega, Dark Dorita, aka Dracula on Genji, and Ion is playing Diablo up at the front line. Over on the right side of the map, we got Team Lopaka with Hunter Org on Brightwing, Panax on Murden, Mirial on Greymane, Lopaka playing Malthale, and Hirath on De Haka. So, in the spirit of Blackheart's Bay, arr, let's go! All that booty! Stacks for Cassia on level 1. And let the games begin. Give me some action. A little bit of pressure against the structures. Get me all those doubloons. And no, <laughs> is he pulling a Lauba? <laughs> no, he isn't. At least not yet. The one minute mark hasn't passed yet, so he still has 30 seconds. But that was still a lot of hit points that Diablo just lost. Let's go. Full on booty time over here. So, who takes it? Who's going to be able to take the lead in the series? Who drops out of the tournament? Who moves on to the next round? This series is going to decide it all. And already, lots of aggression against Drak here. I talked about the CC chain earlier, and that is exactly what we just got. So, we had the poly from Brightwing, we had a Stormbolt from Murden, and it nearly led to uh, an early death for Genji. Still able to get out, but yeah. Now, when we're talking about the map yet, I mentioned it before, you don't really have to necessarily fight on this map. There are always a few strategies where you can play around the objective, and you're essentially just pushing lanes or trying to turn in. Those are the two things, and you are playing around your opponent. Now, you have to be well coordinated in order to pull it off properly, and it helps if you have some heroes that can disengage. Some games come to mind in the past where False that was used for that reason, just use Gust as a disengage tool and make sure that you never had to win a fight or even take a fight. So it can be a little bit awkward. But generally, if the teams are actually going for it, there's a lot of fiesta happening here. We have the chests up on the map now, so all the booty is already in the house. And the attack is coming at the bot lane wall as they're taking a lot of the structures out. And, well, are they losing some heroes in the process? It seems like Greyman is fully blocked off, trying to make his way back out, but still dies. So Greyman eliminated. The rest of the team is retreating though. Well, or are they? Because that's a jet propulsion, but Mirrodin still hops out. Now this map is a little bit similar to Sky Temple, in the sense that you attack structures directly with the objective. So uh, once that you start turning in, no matter what, structures are taking damage. Which means that you have to try and take as many structures out manually just by using your heroes if you want to have more and more value out of the objective also the way that it plays out now is a little bit different than in the past because what happened after blizzard patched the fountains is that the fountain hit points are now connected to the fort so you destroy the fort and then uh, the fountain drops as well Back when the map was actually in the rotation and played also in competitive play, that wasn't the case. So the fountain would soak up one additional shot from the ghost ship. Now that that's not the case anymore and the fountain doesn't soak that shot up, that shot actually connects with the fort directly, which means that even if you don't do any damage at the wall, any whatsoever, you will take with a single turn in one fort out. Back in the day, you had to at least destroy a tower to 50% HP, but now it's a little bit different. So if you're already able to take uh, gates down, to take some towers down, that really helps you in your approach to uh, make get more out of your turn-ins, since obviously the costs for the turn-ins are also increasing over time. So that's something to keep some attention to at least, but yeah. And if you're unfamiliar with the rotation, the first turn in attacks the middle, the second turn in attacks the top, and the third turn in then attacks the bottom until all the forts are destroyed and then the same rotation is happening with teams. Two kills against zero as Greymane falls again. That's the second time that he was eliminated. And Team Nequaza is off to a decent start. Seven doubloons turned in, two heroes destroyed. They have also enough doubloons to uh, finish the turn in, and that's what they're doing here in the middle now with Gamer Boy. And this means the mid lane fort is now going to get demolished. It's going to be gone. So they can take this down a little bit more. Uh, I think it's still going to soak up two. Yep. <laughs> Fortunate. If they just had one more order attack that connected with that tower, they would have saved one of the cannonballs and would have used it for the top lane. But either way, the fort gets destroyed, and that's already a nice win, of course, for them. So yeah, neatly done. 
Lopaka's team just using Greymain for the additional damage and they're still pressuring the bottom of the map so they're trying to go for the fort here. And as I said before, if they're taking these out without the help of the balloons, as long as they can turn in in the later stages of the game, they're going to have an easier time potentially clawing their way back into this if they're falling behind now. But Greymane gets healed again, so this time he is actually able to escape. Previously, he was the first one on the chopping block. Whenever he engaged, they quickly turned on him and were trying to take him out. But, yeah, he's able to get out, and the team is attempting to turn in again with eight of those doubloons in the hands of Madara. Here comes the attack. They're turning on Gamer Boy. Rega is able to move out. Right Bing, on the other hand, is getting uh, the fly spotter. So Trashwing is dead. Three kills to zero. They still fight, even with the four versus five, which means that they're now going for Greymane. He's gone. Muradin escapes. He's on the run and is able to get out, but the rest of the team is still fully committed here. There's only two of them. <laughs> with Marcel gone, the Haka is trying to rush to safety. I suppose he is going to be able to escape, but there's level 10 now for the team. And boy, oh boy, that's going to be a turn in. And therefore, another fort at the top lane is going to fall. The second fort that gets destroyed, there's of course now a structural advantage for the blue team and in addition to that they also have catapult pressure that gets applied onto the lanes. So yeah, definitely looking pretty decent for them. This is a very good start. Now you can always claw your way back into this as I already said if you are able to turn in as well. But this is also slightly different than what we are seeing on let's say Tomb of the Spider Queen. If you're holding the balloons and you get killed, your opponent actually picks them up. So it's not only that you're losing them, your opponent gains them. So all that the red team has to do in order to bring this back is to win some team fights and just snack up everything that we're now seeing in the hands of Team Dequaza. And they're trying exactly that there. The camp is already stolen away. Barbecue play by Diablo, but yep, the camp is lost. Lots of the balloons still in play, 18 in total, and the chests are now spawning for another 10. So yeah, so far, so good. And yeah, we'll see if they can get a bit more out of all of this, especially if we can get that turn in right now. But for the time being, it's all about the team fights again, and they're going for Diablo in an attempt to take him on, even using the old of the Haka, and they're claiming him and the doubloons. Nicely done. Job well done by them. So yep, really sweet play, and it allows them to go for the bottom port finally, which they've already tried to attack earlier, but now they can go for the finishing blow. And as mentioned previously, if you take these out, then your own doubloons will get a bit more value. Always assuming, of course, that you can complete that turn in the first place. Even a few more camps are now being taken. Damn, they're using Greyman on the left side to go for another set of Siege Giants, which means that we have now two and a half of those camps essentially pushing in. So, yep, not bad. Taking even more of those hit points away from the towers, this time down at the bottom of the map. Haven't done a single turn in though. Here is finally turning in two of the doubloons at least. But yep, things are starting to become a little bit more difficult for the team. Six kills to one. I mean the team, I mean the, the blue team. They're losing another hero. That's four doubloons that they've lost again. So it's not too bad. Middle of the map has also been slightly damaged. So they should save one cannonball there. And the turn in is finally ready. So the four mid lane fort will be destroyed now. At least Dequaza was able to pick up a few more doubloons for the team as he moved over. So, yeah, that's another one that they were able to at least use for now. But the shots are being fired in the middle. This fort is going to be destroyed. The Haka using the global at the bottom of the map to try and do even more structural damage thanks to the minion waves that he's pushing through. And top side, it's all about the next battle and the next potential kill. They're coming in, trying to take down Mirrodin. Brightwing to the rescue after Avatar was already used. Quick disengage, going for the... Oh, Diablo! Yeah, going for Emerald Wind. Diablo goes down. Cassia just fighting as much as she can. But she is next up and dies as well. So the red team with another little win here. And they're doing better and better. In the early game, they really struggled after two turn-ins were happening in favor of the blue team and two of their forts got destroyed. But now that they're starting to win these team fights, we are looking at a situation in which they're not only starting to take a lead in experience, they have a ton of doubloons. They have taken multiple forts out as well. And they've just claimed a boss that will allow them to easily take the top fort out. So the next turn in that they use will attack the middle again and will straight up start damaging the keep. So very solid position now for Team Lopaka. Dequaza's team was off to a strong start, but now they are in a bit of trouble. 
Now, if they can win a team fight and, for example, take the 11 doubloons that Miriala holds currently, that would be the play. That's not gonna be too easy. Muradin gets caught, bullet is out, and he's gonna die. Yeah, they're realizing that he's not going to make it, so they're very quickly just disengaging. He didn't uh, hold any doubloons there in the first place, but yep, so far so good for them. So the next little move is already being made now down towards the turn in the blue team at least. Uh, well, actually, no. I thought they were trying to turn in some of the doubloons that they are holding. They still have six, which isn't a huge amount or anything, but it's always better to try and secure them instead of risking giving them over to your opponent. Seven kills to four. Once again, a bit of a chase happening here. And another bullet coming out. Nice. Also the ult from Cassia. Tons of damage from her. Ping-ponging around between the heroes. Disengage again from Brightwing. Really working that Emerald Wind as a tool in those team fights. Level 16 talents are also kicking in fairly quickly. Ten doubloons have been secured, by the way, on the side of the red team. And now the next chests are spawning. It's really going to be difficult for the blue team if they can't secure themselves in the return and if they can't deny it to uh, their opponents. Even Lopaka are in a great spot, but they have to make sure that they're either winning a team fight or that they're turning in. Ideally both. Same goes for their opponents. There's already an... Oh, nice. There's a move with the Arkas ult against Genji and they are able to take him down. So another kill claimed. And boy, there's still a chest up on the map as they're focusing their attention on Diablo. They drop him as well. That's two heroes out and they can destroy the bottom wall. They can go into the middle turn in. They can claim the chest at the top. Worlds, they're always at this point. They're looking exceptionally good at this point in time. So yeah, really nice position for them. The turn in is obviously inevitable. We have the Haka going for the next set of the blue ones that they're picking up here. The turn in is going to attack the middle. Keep is not going to get destroyed right away because everything here is still fully intact, but it is going to take damage and they still have enough doubloons for another turn and afterwards, I think. And yeah, just a question of whether or not they can go for it. They also have a lead in experience now, so they can build on that too. Build on that experience lead that they're currently running here. Malthael, by the way, has in the meantime claimed uh, two stacks for last rights. So that's also pretty neat. Gets the cooldown reduction of 10 seconds thanks to that. 35,000 damage for Greymane. Top dog in the game with 34,000 for Cassia. And well, here's the attempt at turning maybe the five gems, the five balloons in from Gamer Boy. They have a few more. That's in total 15, so they can get the turn in. The first ones are coming together. Parnax wants to interrupt it. It's gonna try to. Dequaz is delivering six, or is looking at it, and yep, they're gonna get the turn in here. This will eliminate the bottom fort. So it's going to prioritize the bot lane now. Bottom fort is going to get crushed. And a bit of damage also done at the middle wall of the red team. But just generally speaking, Team Lopaka is still slightly ahead here. Still maintaining a small lead on this. Very close game though. Awesome for our first map and I mean for this match and what we can expect from it in the first place. Seven kills to six. Very close in experience too, so yeah, looking good on that. But what about the potential turn-in from uh, Team Lopaka? Because again, they have plenty, and the blue team is fully aware of it. 31 doubloons are up for grabs. Oh, the ancestral, the timing! <laughs> Holy hell, that was big. This might actually win them the fight. If they can do something here, this might be the one that wins them the battle. Right here, right now. So they're starting to make a play. Cassia is getting attacked and she falls. So does Malfail. The bloodbath commences. More and more kills coming through. Brightwing Diablo. <laughs> it's a slaughter. So many doubloons now. It's a total crazy setup where Panax gets stopped, jumps away with Muradin. He has six doubloons. There's 12 on Greymane. They're trying to get away from this, trying to escape here. They're turning <laughs> and Rega. Rega gets wrecked. But so do they. All the doubloons. 24 in the hands of those two alone. And there's the turn in. There's the opportunity. That's the beauty of Blackheart's Bay sometimes. Absolutely bonkers. Yep. That's how quickly the game can flip the attack towards the middle. The keep is going to probably get destroyed here. Even with the red team picking up the early level 20. 
So a huge fight and a huge opportunity now for Team Nekwaza to maybe take the lead in game number one of the series after all. Nicely done. The attack towards the boss at the top now. So yes, the keep in the middle is going to fall. The attack is then going to center towards the top lane. Yeah, off it goes. First keep destroyed and now at the top they're going to soften this up. And guess what? That's exactly the lane where the boss is going to move through. Exactly that lane. So the chance to take maybe a second keep out with the push here. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. On the damage side, we have 38,000 for Genji, 48,000 for Greymane. The red team is still doing okay, grabbing some extra doubloons here. And they have turned in a few with Hira. He held 10 doubloons back and he was able to deliver them. So that secured them for now. They're not out of this yet. It's 20 versus 20, but definitely a spicy game. <laughs> really spicy first one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they get both out. They were trying to trap them as they realized where they were because they stole the cams and the doubloons away. And they half out and both of them made it. Now the top side keep gets attacked too and is taking some damage. But thanks to Greymane, who gets actually rooted here. No, 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 no. Yeah, we saw that. Thanks to Greymane, they're able to chunk it down and save the keep for now. Bottom of the map, of course, another camp claimed, and therefore also two more doubloons added to the mix. Turn in could happen. <laughs> yeah, 50 stacks for Cassia. Nice damage coming from her now as well. And the attack comes through once again as they're getting a check propulsion out. Here comes Genji with a quick X strike. And they're trying to get that kill. Brightwing disengage, used once more. They want the kill, they get the kill. Down goes Blaze. Blaze eliminated, barbecued. Diablo trying to save him here, but at least they are able to take Marcel down. He takes, well, he has taken. No one can stop death and immediately buys back. So he is back to business now. And the turning could still happen for the red team as more doubloons appear on the map. More chests are spawning. They have the turn in, but they're not quite sure what the, the blue team is now going to do. It's a 5 versus 4 though, and Team Dequaza has absolutely zero interest in fighting this. No whatsoever. None whatsoever. So, with that, here comes the turn in from here, Earth. That is going to uh, finish off the keep in the middle and then attack the one at the top. Shouldn't be able to destroy both though, but still do some damage. And kind of equalize the structural position on the map, of course. So, yeah, there's that. Now the attack, still moving towards the next few camps. All about getting a few more doubloons in. All about trying to get a bit farther ahead with this. Shots are being fired. And honestly, now that I look at it, they might actually get the second keep. It looks more and more likely that they can. I thought a few more shots would be soaked up by that wall. And it just didn't happen that way. So, yep, that's the second keep destroyed. They're officially going to take the lead. Blue team can, of course, repay them in kind. But they have to turn in. <laughs> it could all come down to a team fight here in the middle. Yep. There it is. There's the opportunity. And the fight breaks out right away. The Haka is sorely needed now and needs to tunnel in. Is coming through as we speak. Murden with a quick hop as he starts to engage again. Tries for the storm board. Rhaegar with a self ancestral. They wanted a doggy, but they couldn't get him. Now the counter attack. Brightwig is dead. Brightwig is down. The Haka survived. They need a counter kill. They need it quickly. Beautiful hit there from Malthael as he gets a fourth stack for last rights and eliminates Genji. The shield was too early. Diablo dies too. Big damage from Cassia again. She's sitting at 65 stacks as well. Madara just absolutely crushing it here with 56,000 damage. The situation not over just yet. 18 doubloons against 16. Each team has just enough to get themselves a turn in. Big wave also at the top that is starting to push for the core, but they are letting it go. They're disengaging in the four versus four, and they're just letting them do their thing. Without Brightwing, without their healer, they're just not comfortable engaging. So the top keep is now gonna get destroyed, and after that, the bottom keep is going to take some additional damage. The shots are being fired, the hits are coming, as Blaze is starting to defend up at the top, but damn, what the first game between these two. This is exactly the kind of match that you want as your final match in the group. So, yeah, all comes down to this. The rematch between Team Lequaza and Team Lopaka. Muradin with a double hop uses Rewind to close the gap and connect the Stormbolt. But they couldn't catch anybody off guard here. 
The huge advantage for Team Lopaka is, of course, also the fact that they are still reliant on the Haka in this game. They have the global. And here is tunneling towards the middle. They want to get that turn in. And they're gonna get it. Yep. They should be able to get it. Well, Dequaza. Oh, 15. <laughs> One is missing. One is missing. They hold five doubloons, but they're missing one. The blue team, by the way, has only two. So there's only one team that could turn in. And thanks to the fact that there's only one tower standing at the bottom map, very much alone, this would annihilate the bottom keep. So there's an opportunity to take the keep down and make the core a really big target. The catapults are already starting to push for it. And there is no global on the side of Team Banana Age. So that's a big problem. The Haka has the advantage here for them. Yeah, another quick hit is coming. They're also starting to pellet Diablo's hit points down. And the bullet is coming through soon as well. They could move into the middle and try to get that turn in. All that they need to do for now is turn in that one doubloon. X strike, team fight. Again, Diablo gets the ancestral, hits once, and has to Hellgate out just to save himself. <gasps> what an attack by Genji! And that is a double kill. Malthael is dead and buys back, but Greymin and Muradin fall to... I really don't think they needed to fight this fight. I think they could have just moved towards the middle and turn in here, but damn, 16 to 12 kills, and it seems like this is likely the end of it. This seems like it just might be all she wrote. The turn-in is finally happening. So, yep, they are going to get the uh, keep at the bottom of the map. But how are they going to stop the, co the boss from ending the game? They have to essentially try and threaten the core and force them to half. And then hope for Greymain to be back and to be able to defend it. So this is, at the end of the day, the only thing that they can do. Try and go for the core, escort some catapults in, force the opponent to retreat. Hereth is already trying to defend, and I just don't think that a normal defense is going to cut it. I think they just have to threaten the core somehow, and it's nearly impossible. No catapults nearby. A couple of shots are being fired at the core and start to take down the shield, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be enough. So, no. They're not making the move. They're trying to defend, and I don't think there is any chance of making that happen. Shots are fired. Chests are spawning. The boss is already on the core. This is going to be the lead for Team Dequaza, barring an incredible miracle. <laughs> no chance. Just, just no chance. Absolutely insane. Nicely done. Well played. And a fantastic first map in this best of five series as Team Dequaza takes the lead and the 1-0 in this match. GG and well played. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Kaldor TV. To the Spider Queen, map number two. Okay, De Quasa and his boys, they've taken the lead now, a 1-0. Quick reminder, we have one rule for the draft here, and that is that every hero that got played cannot be played again. So the 10 heroes that were played in game number one cannot be played any longer. So, just a thing to keep in mind here real quickly as we're continuing with all of this. Once that we're heading into game number 2, 3, 4, 5, obviously uh, all of that increases and the hero pool gets whittled down a little bit. It's nothing insane, nothing crazy, but it creates a bit more hero diversity and it will have eventually in the best of 5 series also have an impact on how the teams are drafting all of this. But again, there are no pre-bans, this is not meta madness, we are not really trying to force people into Gazla or anything. The bounty system was specifically designed to avoid that from happening, to just give it teams as an option in order to make a bit more money for themselves. So yeah, just keep that in mind here as we're continuing with the draft if some of the heroes are missing and I'm, I don't think I've really pointed out in game number one yet. But well, Doom of Spider Queen, I, I really like Doom. Tomb is a fun map and I honestly think it should be mandatory for every single best of five series because it is just a real fun one and because the lanes are so close together and the map is rather small you get usually also a lot of action with that so yeah very enjoyable normally teams play very aggressive compositions here too we now get Mayev banned out and game number one really highlighted that the teams are super close now I talked about this in the first game that they played when we started the group stage that these two teams actually finished the round robin as fourth and fifth place. So Dequaza's team came in as ranked number four, and then we had uh, Team Lopaka as ranked number five. 
So it was pretty cool to see them just so close and it really gets reflected not only in the first match that they played, where again, as I pointed out, Lopaka's team won with a 3-1 score, but you can already tell from the first map that they played here. So yeah, let's see what they can pull off now. Maybe they, uh, Lopaka can come back. Maybe they Quasa, they figured it out now and they can get revenge for the loss in the previous match that they played. Now that Sylvanas is actually available, the first thing that happens right away is that Madara locks it in mega quickly. So yeah, good for them. And they got Johanna. That's an insane first rotation, by the way. That is an absolutely insane first pick rotation that they just got here. Um, yeah. I am very curious how this continues. You get the best tank, or one of the best tanks, for Tomb of the Spider Queen, and you get Sylvanas, which is, of course, incredible when you're trying to push for structures. So, we got Garrosh and Gul'dan on the other side. They're going full smork over here. But, yeah. I'm actually really, really curious how they're going to counter a pick because Sylvanas can push with the objective, can easily defend the objective, burst those lanes down. He's super strong, one of the reasons why she gets continuously banned here. And on top of that, we also have Johanna. I'm looking at this and they already have wave clear just covered. So from here on out, whatever they're picking, they will have enough wave clear for all of that. So, not bad. Hanzo gets banned, provides vision, provides interrupter potential. Don't really want to deal with that. But yeah, that's our next pick. And let's see what we're getting. Well, next ban. I'm also interested in the next double pick, to be honest with you. So I'm already jumping mentally ahead a bit. Urel, okay. But yeah, let's go. One hero, by the way, that what we're talking about heroes that I haven't really seen a whole lot, which really surprises me, is we haven't seen any Nazebo through the entire tournament so far. We actually debated making Nazebo a bounty and we didn't because we thought, okay, teams will pick him anyways. Not a lot, but the occasional Nazebo was played in Banshee Cup season number one without it being a bounty. So I'm a little bit surprised. If we ever set up another season, who knows, then uh, I think Nazebo as a potential bounty might just be another thing. But yeah, Leoric and Anduin. Okay, so they get the crybaby. And they get Leo. It's a weird combo to me because every single time that I see Leoric and there's Anduin on the other side, it's like one of those aww moments where you're thinking like, well, his ults are going to be worthless. Well, not worthless, but going to be negated a lot. But in this case, they're actually tag teaming it and playing together. We have Rexa and Falstad. Okay, so full draft for the team now. Disengage potential, Gul'dan with Horrify. But how is Draken now bringing the draft together for them? Final pick. Final pick for map number one with Team Liquaza in the lead. It's Mephisto. We're getting a mage, everyone. Two Spider Queen. Let's go. Game number two. Dequaza's team is in the lead and it is party time. Who is going to be able to win the second map? Are we going to get a 2-0 lead now for them? Or are we going to get a 1-1 with Team Lopaka tying it up? Dequaza on the left with Leoric. We have Gamer Boy on Anduin. We're getting Marder on Mephisto. Ion on Johanna. We're currently looking also, in addition to that, at uh, Drak here on Sylvana. So a really nice combo for them. And yeah, on top of that, as you can see, it is Falstad, played by Lopaka himself. We have Panax on Garrosh, Hirath on Rexa, Huntork on Lucio, and Miriale is playing the Drain build with Gul'dan. So, nice. Nicely done, sweet play, and it is time to shine. If you are the red team, you want to win this one. Badly. I mean, really badly. Already a big brawl happening straight up in the middle. They need a win here. You ah, uh, they, <laughs> they got so close to get the kill against Jana, but yep, not not really, not quite. No. So the important part here really is that at this point in time, when you're talking about the scores, you don't want to fall behind with an 0-0. Yes, reverse sweeps are always possible, but they're so unlikely. They happen every now and then. And every time they do, we celebrate them because they're just so unlikely. So in a case like this, you really, really want to make sure that you're winning at least one now. And then you can continue it from there. But it's going to make your life so much easier if you essentially turn the game into a best of three 
by tying the score up. So can they pull that off? That's the big question. The problem is I really like the draft for the blue team. They have a lot of damage potential. They have Sylvanas and also Leo, so they could be Veiling Arrow and Tomb go for the poor man's buried alive. They have lots of fantastic tools here. Not like the red team doesn't have anything that they can use. They have, of course, Horrify, they have Gust. They have a lot of tools that they can use themselves in order to make this work for them. But there is a potential that with an objective, Sylvanas is pressuring heavily and is just taking people out. So, yeah, it's one of the things that would worry me a bit. But they are already looking at the typical aggression that we're used to from them. Starting to go for the camp and attempting to steal it away, maybe even. They're going deep for this. But, yeah, the blue team is not falling for it too much. The problem is that the blue team is now not in possession of their own camp and has previously already been taken by the red team, so they were able to do some damage at the wall. So it was a neat little move that they made here. They saw the discrepancy in the timings and they executed a nice attack that delayed things for Team Dequaza. Nothing insane, but it's a small little play that can really add up as things continue to pan out here. And, well, there's the attack. Lucio gets killed. Uh-oh, could be a double. Nah, they're getting away. But still, first blood, maybe the counter kill, and Anduin is ruining the day once more. So, yeah. No counter kill for them, unfortunately. One kill to zero is all that we're getting. Leo has now already turned his gems in. They're having 21 gems that they're still holding. So the blue team is a bit more diligent right from the get-go in game number two to secure the gems that they're holding there. They don't want to lose anything on this. <laughs> Madara. Mephisto is not really a hero that is good at running away. So he's trying to escape. But if he wants to survive, he needs some help. And I don't think he's going to get enough. Nope. Mephisto is gone. The gems are lost. And now they're going for the tank. And Johanna dies too. So, yeah. They're even guarding the gems, denying them to the blue team. Job well done. Gamer Boy gets nearly killed as a result, but what happens instead is that they're moving in for Garrosh and they're taking him down and some of the gems are now also denied. Okay, again, game number one was awesome. A lot of back and forth action and would you know it, in game number two it's apparently going to be the exact same thing since they're just going blow to blow here with one hit after another. So I'm really liking it. Two kills against two. We now have in total 52 gems for the red team, so they could really deliver. Whereas the blue team, they suffered a few losses. They lost a couple of gems, and they have to step it up a little bit if they want to get the first turn in of the game. Level 7 talents are now available for both of the teams here. Leo, in regards to his build, has gone for Ghastly Reach and for Consume Vitality. So slight adjustments here made by the Quasa too. But yeah. Very, very enjoyable early game, at least, on the map. I definitely like that. But yeah, so the attacks are coming. Here's the next hit that comes in very quickly. And now the question, what else can they do regarding the turn-in? Because the blue team is obviously falling a little bit behind on that. But it would be pretty neat for them if they could just get... Yeah, there's another kill. Leo is down. Leo eliminated. And off they go. So with Leo taken out, that's now a situation in which you can finally start to turn a little bit more in. Can uh, maybe get that Web Weaver wave the first one and then take some of the forts out or at least destroy the walls. And that's exactly what we are now getting. Well, the turn in. Not necessarily the destroyed walls. That's something that we have to still watch out for. But they were able to get the turn in. They completed it. They get the first set of Web Weavers. The continuous kills against the... Uh, Red blue team were so far pretty good. They want another one. They're already setting it up against Leo, and the Quasar goes down. Now, to be fair, that kill means little. He's going to be back in a few seconds. It's not a big window that they're playing around with. So, yeah, he's going to be fine. Can defend, but he's losing a bit of time, obviously. So, some time will be lost here. Sylvanas is defending at the top. So, she's currently doing it all solo, whereas the rest of the team is trying to help out in the middle. But good for Team Lopaka to push the envelope right from the get-go and trying to build up the momentum to snowball the game. Exactly what they should do in order to claim a victory here. So, yeah, well done. Down at the bottom of the map. Attacks also still coming in. They break through the walls. Falstead is trying to get the fort in the middle. Level 10 abilities are now also available. They have a half-level lead over the blue team. So another reason for the Quasa and his boys to sit back a little bit and maybe not engage here. They are more or less sacrificing the fort in the middle. 
It's super low and can be at any point picked up by Gul'dan, for example. But down at the bottom of the map, they're still holding their ground and making sure that nobody is destroying this just too easily. But yeah, the mid lane fort, while still standing, should soon fall. Now, with level 10 on both sides, it's going to be an even playing field again for the next battle. We get Light Bomb, we get, of course, Leo with Entomb, and then on top of that we have Wailing Arrow. So, the ults that you would expect from their end. But it's not only about the ults here, they really also got to step it up a bit in those team fights now. They have enough gems for a turn in finally, but they're generally speaking still trailing when it comes to the gem count. So, turning in, maybe also getting a few kills and denying gems to the opponent would be highly important. And we'll figure out fairly quickly if they can actually do that. Yeah, Sylvanas. <laughs> nice! Nice play by Anduin. I thought she was dead. But every single time that you think somebody is about to die, Anduin comes in and ruins the play. That's just the kind of killjoy he is. Talking about killjoys, that gust helped the blue team more than, uh, than anything else. So, yeah, I'm not so sure about that gust play. But they're still able to at least take Johanna down, so good for them. But, yeah, the gust was still a little bit sus. I think false that got paid off here. So, yeah. Let's just double check that. Let's have another look at Falstad and that Gust. Because they look quite okay here. So, yeah, <laughs> I have no idea what that Gust was supposed to do. <laughs> Can somebody explain this to me? I thought maybe I missed someone dropping low and he was just trying to save it and then they were like, okay, we don't want to lose anybody. But if I saw that correctly, then they executed the horror fight. Either he had chained it up and was just not really paying attention, but there were essentially two heroes being pushed into the red team and he kind of saved them. So he was clearly paid off. Falstad, they paid him off with a can of worms or something, but because that was more than a little bit suspicious. Bottom Ford gets now taken out, and all jokes aside, you have to give it to Team Lopaka. They're doing well. Two forts destroyed, one level lead, five kills to two. Boah, the ult fully missing. He really anticipated that uh, Falstad would push in further. Which he clearly didn't. Now we have more web weavers on the map. Ports are gone. Top side, well, top side is still standing, but that's the one that they're currently attempting to take down. So, yeah, they're already working on that. Another big flip. Madara. Yeah, he's definitely the one that can't die. He's holding way too many gems. He's at 22 gems and be <laughs> careful, guys. Yeah, another fort falls. So, this one gets dropped. And well, that's the third one that gets annihilated. So far, we haven't seen a single turn in for the blue team. Team Nequaza haven't had Web Weavers yet. And Team Nequaza also hasn't destroyed a single port yet. So, yeah, it's pretty bad. But, well, with this, what else are we going to get here? The move towards the top as they're starting to go for the boss. So they're going to try at, at next. Down at the bottom of the map, we're currently having Lopaka still using his global. I mean, again, you got a global on the map as well. You can uh, side lane pressure. They are not able to go for the boss because the blue team sniffed it out. But while everybody is up at the top trying to deny the boss to them, Falsal is getting free value at the bottom of the map. So, yeah, there's another big one here. Now, down to the bot lane, we're getting Lopaka still pushing this one out, making some plays, trying to get damage in on the keep. Somebody will have to retreat, but as long as they have full vision on the entire team, there is no need for him to retreat. So he's just still sitting there, he's like, guys, if you don't come here, I'm just pushing. Team Nequaza is currently getting fully outplayed here on a macro level. Look at this. Full value, free keep, right there. All that the red team has to do is not die while they're trying to delay the turn in. It's all that they gotta do. Even if the turn in happens, it's fine. They're getting massive value at the bottom of the map. Now they're chasing them a little bit. Falstad, he's done 50% uh, damage. Can now fly in and help out. His team is suffering a couple of hit point losses. But even if he just gusts to disengage. <laughs> Lopaka. Lopaka is drunk. He's clearly drunk. This is the second gust that essentially goes nowhere. I was about to say, if he just if he just gusts to disengage, it's fine. But where are these gusts going? So Garrosh is now dead. I think he's drunk on his own success or something. 
Maybe after they lost the winner's match to Banana Age, he just like drank himself into a stupor because he was just like, it's not worth living for anymore. Guys, we failed. I failed you. Maybe something like that is going on, but whatever it is, it is really weird. So, yeah. Level 16 is up. Red team is obviously still doing fantastic here. I mean, they're playing a great game. They're heavily ahead by more than a level now. The bottom keep is suffering more and more hit point losses as even the minions contributed to it. Lopaka is now moving in from the side. He's very unpredictable. That's the good thing about his playstyle. He is also going to die here now. But yeah, this is a very unpredictable playstyle. Even his own team doesn't know what he's going to do next. Can somebody please deal with the catapult here at least? I guess no. Falstead is dead. Leo's dead. I mean, everybody in the mid lane died as they went for the chicken. So maybe it was a ruse after all. And Lopaka is just a master beta. Masterful play by him. Uh, I mean, who knows? But now they're moving in for Sylvanas. And guys, I am not quite sure what happened between game number one and game number two. But Team Lopaka is just ripping them a new one here. Nine kills to five. And just utter destruction. They can essentially turn in. They're 10 gems short of getting another turn in. And they're farming them. This is a farming simulator what we're seeing here. This is just an absolute farming simulator. This is nothing else. It's just like farm, 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 farm. And that is basically it. So they're coming in with one attack after another. And yeah. I mean, I've seen like some farm games where there were less potatoes than here. It's getting bonkers. So currently we're having 57,000 for Gul'dan. We've got 33,000 for, uh, yeah, for, uh, um, for Mephisto. It's just not enough. But yeah, it's kind of crazy. So, hmm. <laughs> okay, Misha gets killed. Huh. I'm a little bit, I mean, the games are being clipped. Blue team turns in. Good for them to finally get the turn in. They have level 16 talents, and that was obviously one of the things that helped them back that they were at a talent disadvantage, but it doesn't change anything for the team fight. They're losing Leoric. They're losing also Sylvanas. And, well, Gamer Boy is dead too. Only Gul'dan falls. 13, 14 kills. They're going for 15, and that is game. That's just game right here. Full five-man team wipe. They destroy the entire team with ease, one might say. And a very impressive performance by Team Lopaka. That was really important for them to win the map here. To make sure that they're not going 0-2 in the best of five. So, yeah, the big push is coming. But the web weavers for the blue team are, of course, still there. So, they still need to right-click the core. Leo wants a kill and doesn't get it. But now Sylvanas is back and they decide that they can't end. <laughs> they decide that they can't end the game just now. I'm actually not sure if I agree or disagree with it. It's a safe play to move away now. So they're, they're playing it very safe. They had instances in the past where they went too hard on the core and then got punished for it. So on the one hand, I want to uh, yeah, be... I mean, on the one hand, I will accommodate them and be like, okay, guys, like, nicely done. On the other hand, I'm looking at those 80% on the core and I'm like, could they have ended? Maybe a bit too much of a question mark. But to be fair to them, they took a keep out, they lost the four, they have level 20 now. So they are still very much in the driver's seat. So risk it and go for the core or just play it safe, go for the next team fight with a huge storm talent advantage and take it there. They're deciding to go for the safer play. Anduin goes down, Leo goes down, Johanna goes down. It's just the same shit that we saw a second ago. So yeah, 21 kills to six. Boy, oh boy, are they crushing them. They're going through Team Dequaza like hot butter through cheese. Ridiculous. Well done, well played, and what an absolute statement here on Tomb of the Spider Queen. Incredibly well done. Kudos to Team Lopaka. A well-deserved win on our second map, and that puts us into a 1-1 situation score-wise as we are headed for game number three. GG. Gun of Terror, game number three. Gonna be honest, 
I'm kind of happy that we have a 1-1 score. I was a bit afraid that we might see one of the teams, you know, just after the first series that they played against each other, figured out the other team, and now being able to get a clean 3-0 victory, and that would have... It, would just, it just wouldn't have made the series justice. That's just what it is. So, yeah, now we have at least four maps out of this, and I'm all in for it because it's been super fun so far, and I really like those two clashing. I love watching Team Lopaka, and I like that on the second map they actually were at the core and decided to leave it, which is kind of amazing. <laughs> if you watched any, any of the matches of the red team, you know how crazy it is that they actually decided to move away from it. Chogal gets banned. Again, Lopaka's team is the only one so far that played Chogal multiple times. Not only did they complete a Chogal bounty, but they also used him afterwards a few times in an attempt to get themselves a few more points. So the entire goal for them really was to use him also as a very, very strong tool in their arsenal. So that's why it's being shut down here by uh, Team De Quasa. And I like that they... Yeah, Team Dequas has struggled a bit on the second map, but specifically the first one was incredibly well played. Now that we have Madara with Hanzo, ooh, that's also nice. I've told the story before, and people that watch this regularly and watch all of the games are probably a bit bored by it, because I must have mentioned it specifically at the Nations Cup a lot in the past. But Madara is the first Hanzo player that I have seen with um, the meme talent, with Meme Strike that actually got value with it, where I was like, okay, I can see it. I've seen a lot of attempts before where people were, for, for example, trying to go for Meme Strike plus um, Entomb from Leoric and trying to get value there and never really worked out. And Madara was the first Hanzo player that I saw that used Meme Strike in a way that he always got value, even if he didn't do damage. Because he zoned opponents away, he split teams, and just from their tactical perspective, he did so much for the team, it was beautiful. So yeah, it was really, really good, and he did it all at the Nations Cup. And here again, a quick note to everybody. If you haven't watched the Nations Cup yet, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, and you're sitting there like, huh, what, Nations Cup, eh? Make sure that you check out the, the playlist on my YouTube channel. You are not going to read it. It was by far, and I mean by far, the best tournament that we had in the last six to seven years in Heroes of the Storm offline event took place in Berlin. We had teams from North America, from Korea, from Europe, and it was an absolute blast. Multiple caster teams, an insane audience that we had there. And if you haven't watched that yet, do yourself a favor, you can thank me later. Check out the playlist. If you watch nothing else, at least watch the grand final. The grand final was epic on a proportion that you can't imagine. I would highly recommend to watch the entire playlist. If you don't want to do that, Watch at least the grand final playlist on my YouTube channel. If you haven't watched it yet, check it out. Ah, Madara, exactly. So, there he did it too. And that's why every single time I see him Hanzo, it's kind of reminiscent of that. And uh, I'm already looking forward to it, even though I expect him to go for Arrow here. EGC in Tyrande, talking about old school, so they're already going for the good old Miranda build. It seems very likely that they're using ETC as a side lane again, which they've already done a couple of times and it really works, but you still get, of course, the most out of the power slide, and then you have also Tyrande in uh, the position to go and follow up with an edit stun. Varian as the main tank, here we go. <laughs> Twist coming in, ETC main tank, Varian meme blades bounty attempt on the side lane. <laughs> the only thing I have to say to, say, to that is that's not happening. But again, it's a sniper composition. You come in with Varian Taunt, you have a stun from EDC, you have a stun from Tuaranda, you have the Hunter's Mark that you apply, and then Chromie just says, all right, it's out, and bam, goes in and kills them all. But, well, with that, we're now getting uh, May and Thrall picked. So we have May plus Urel. It's a pretty difficult frontline to break through. Thrall as a third hero. And then Hanzo, big map obviously with Garden of Terror. So using Thrall is also helping you with the additional clear on camps that you really want to want to have there. But the red team clearly wants to kill heroes. I mean, they're coming in here. They want to kill heroes. They have CC on every single one there. Some kinds of like slow stun or whatever. And now Lopaka with a final pick probably going to chip in a bit more damage. We get Stukov. So double support with this even. Can of course slap with that too. But really interesting draft runs again from Team Lopaka. So guys, let's go. Gun of Terror, it's our third map in the best of five. Let's see which team takes the lead in the final match of Group A. Game number three. On the left, Dequaza with Urel. Madara on Hanzo. Gamer Boy on Malfurion. 
We have Drakia on Thrall and Ion is playing May with a heat transfer on level 1. Over on the right side, Team Lopaka, after winning on Tomb of the Spider Queen, now pretty eager to uh, follow it up with a second victory. We have Hunter Org on Tyrande, Lopaka on Stukov, so we're already going for some big slaps over here. With Hirath on ETC, Miriala on Chromie, and Panax is playing Varian. That CC chain, it's gonna be a CC chain straight out of hell. It's gonna be brutal. Once that they have level 4 unlocked for uh, our boy Varian, they can obviously start with a taunt and then it's just like all that goodness with even a lurking arm now following up. And let's see if this is going to be successful for them. They're obviously going to try and take out the opposition as quickly as they can in those fights. They definitely have the tools for it. Urel, hard to kill. May, hard to kill as well. But even with those guys, it could be difficult to uh, <laughs> survive through all of that damage and all of those stuns. That are sure going to come as this game continues. A little bit of a skirmish in the middle of the map already right at the start. Nothing too crazy. Nothing too insane. Everybody is still able to walk away from it. There were a few heroes that were maybe a bit close uh, to dying. But just generally speaking, a fairly solid start into the game as everybody starts splitting up onto the lanes now. So we have a few of them already sitting up at the top lane. Varian in this case goes up against Dequaza. We have the heroes that we would normally see on camps doing exactly that. Clearing some of the mercenaries out. And it's kind of funny that it's Tyrande, Chromie and Stukov that are trying to take it. <laughs> so not necessarily the the strongest combo when you're just talking about like sheer mercenary clear so <laughs> definitely one thing to uh, definitely note and they're getting attacked right away the red team is defending blue team wants to steal it away but now they are sacrificing may potentially and yeah you can scratch the potentially because she is indeed busted may is gone gets very quickly killed here and that was a good start for the team in red, not only grabbing the objective, in this case the camp, but also able to get a kill on top of that. And to make matters worse, of course, their opponents uh, therefore wasted a lot of time in the process and got nothing out of it. So this is kind of what you want to do in a situation like this. So solid start into the game and they immediately lead also with an dead attack at the top that allows them to now go quickly for damage on the towers on the gate, try and break through the wall, but Chromi gets kind of isolated here and then quickly murdered. So it's a kill for a kill as this seems to be exactly in the same vein as the previous two maps. They're getting very, very close games between the two teams and I couldn't be happier for it because this is exactly what we want to see here. We want to see that fight for that final slot in the next round, at least final slot out of Group A. Who stays in the tournament? Who drops out? Questions to be answered over the course of this best of five in the middle. The fight's already continuing as they're looking for the next big attack. Shots being fired. Chromie with good damage against Malfurion in particular here. So yep, neat. And then on top of it, we still have Urel at top lane pushing out. Oh, oh, May. Maybe a little bit too much. Yep, this time she goes down. Second kill for the red team. But as I was about to say, Urel is doing also some solid work up at the top as she starts just starting to take them out here. So he has one tower and the gate have been destroyed. Easy peasy, no problem for them. And down in the middle of the map, of course, there's also Khan Khan Po coming from Team Lopaka. So everybody's just like trying to take the early structures out. Kill a tower here, kill a gate there. Try and see if you can pick up a hero kill in the process as well, which so far has happened twice for the red team, once for their opponents. But yeah, it's all wrapping around, trying to get some camps for them, of course, as well now and rotating very quickly also down to the bottom of the map as May gets caught again, but there's not enough stun as a follow-up yet. I think Tyrande was on cooldown, ETC is at the top lane, so Varian's taunt is the only thing that they got out. The early level 7 is already kicking in for now. So yeah, one kill to zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one kill to two. But good damage at the top side for it. It's actually way more damage than I thought they would be able to establish here this early in the game. So, yep, they're able to do a little bit on uh, the fort and have it all ready to 50%, which is actually quite a lot this early in the game, to be honest with you. I mean, this is a lot that they were able to do here. 
Because right now when you're thinking about it, we are how long? Four, four and a half minutes into the game. One four down to 50%. Rest of the team still pushing down at the bottom of the map. Bit of a lead experience as far as early structure destruction goes. That's pretty solid. That taunt on the other hand, just imagine if he jumped out half a second later. That hit him mid-air pretty much. He would have died for sure. But now it seems like they're, yeah, <laughs> they're killing Thrall instead. They got angry. They got angry that they couldn't kill Hanzo. And who can blame them? I would also be angry. I want to kill Hanzo too. Who isn't getting annoyed by Hanzo? I mean, honestly, everybody is. Hanzo is the soy boy personified. Hanzo is the guy that sits at a, at a Starbucks and goes for that, like, soy latte with the two shots, some extra whipped cream, half temperature and like extra whatever and you just want to murder the guy. He's the guy that goes to McDonald's, stands in line for half an hour and then he goes to the front of the line he's like, so um, what am I getting? Like, I don't know, like what do you have? Like, do you have, can I have, uh, do you also do this with and without? Can I have this with pickles or without? That's, that's Hanzo, that's Hanzo. Everybody knows that guy. Everybody knows them. So no wonder that they get mad that they didn't get at Hanzo. Everybody wants to slap that guy a couple of times. Who hasn't been at any fast food joint, stand in a queue for like 10, 15 minutes, and then the guy in front of you goes to the front and takes like 10 minutes to just read the menu. So we all know that guy, and we all want to slap him or whip him. One of the two, but the last one's a bit kinky. Which is exactly what uh, Chrome usually likes, but in this case she gets only moonfired by Malfurion. But they're not only going for... Oh, ho, 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 that's a catch. <laughs> that is really a catch. So the Karen of the Storm gets hit, and that arrow, work of art. I mean, not even close to hitting anybody. They're saving that for game number four. So the attacks keep coming after they took uh, Tyrande and Stukov out. They're now dropping uh, variants. So that's a triple kill. And I, I think I've seen this before. Just the last time that I saw it, it was the red team making those plays. But boy, even with the arrow missing, they killed everything at the bottom of the map. Arrow didn't even connect and everybody here was just wrecked. Also, noteworthy, me praising Madara's Hanzo and then the first thing that happens once they get level 10 is he misses an arrow and goes full and arrow on us. Full and A. So yeah, and you should never go full NA. What is Tyrande doing, by the way? The Karen of the Storm went to the front to complain to the manager, ran straight into the middle of the team and was like, I have a complaint! And then she was hit and she was killed. And yes, I've been here for a while. This was a long day. Six kills to three. So yeah, Tyrande, I'm not quite sure what the game plan was, but uh, she came, she saw, and she died. Veni, VD, BG. She literally spent, I mean, she came from the Nexus, ran in, died again, and yeah, maybe maybe it's nice in the Nexus. Maybe it's nice and warm, I have no idea. But the seed gets claimed as the second one for the red team. Now that they're claiming it, we have still another one. Arrow straight into ETC. Nice. And they kill Yorel, and they're killing May. It seems, just maybe, that Team Lopaka hasn't quite done with this yet. So, yeah. <laughs> this is that kill com that I talked about. <laughs> Once that the CC train is going, you are hitting them and you are hitting them hard, baby. So, yeah, six kills to six. And do you know what you get when you turn a six on its head? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I swear to God, that's water in my cup. It's really water. <laughs> So, level 13 is up next here. And, well, in terms of damage, we have 32,000 damage for Chromi now. We got 21,000 for Thrall. He's actually top damage for the team. So, yeah. Camp still being claimed, and I find it still hilarious that they don't have a proper hero that can deal with mercenary camps right now. They just have to... They have to send some of the plebiest mercenary heroes that exist in the game in. There's no Greymane here, there's no Hogga, there's nobody that is really totally crushing it. So, yeah, they're taking a while on this one. But anyways, down to the bottom of the map, Yurel still trying to push it out. Don't forget, she's the one that has been responsible for all the damage at the top. The Space Goat right there. And they go for the third seed. Stun, damage, stun, 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 more damage, more stun, more arrow, more hits, more and... Nobody dies! <laughs> that slap and finally May is gone. May is gone, they're trying for Drakia, Thrall is dead as well, <laughs> and damn. Now they're slapping, eight kills, two, six, 
and they get those Garden Terrors. Hanzo was trying to interrupt them there. Nirel, by the way, at the bottom of the map, still attempting to at least get value for the team by destroying a fort. And this is likely going to work. At least it's going to be mega low. But the rest of the team is already sitting at the top and uh, just, yeah, repaying them here. Destruction is imminent. So, Garden Terrors are on the map. And they're trying... <laughs> they see Varian and they run. And they better run. If he gets a charge and a taunt, then the next hero falls. So Team Lopaka beasting it here in the middle of the game. Once that you saw the draft, you knew exactly what they were trying to do. You knew exactly what the idea was behind all of it. And now they're getting the fort at the top lane. They're getting the fort at the bottom of the map. This is going to be destroyed here in the middle. They're still too like well, Trying to see if they maybe can get a kill. May is still running around in that little bear costume over there, thinking she's cute. But Varian is not being fooled by any of that. So he's coming in and taking them out. Uh, or at least trying to the Parker. <laughs> yeah, was trying to zone them. Nice dodge, by the way. Really good juke. So Topside is still getting pressured by the camp. Thrall has to help the team out, though. They want to go for the team fight. Arrow! Big one! Big arrow! Tyrande is out! Tirana's gone, Chromie is gone, and yep, they stayed just a little bit too long. The arrow of Madara was absolutely beautiful this time. And then they followed it up also with the Ice Wall from May. Three heroes were killed as a result, and that is Team Dequaza bringing it back a little bit. Coming in, just saying, you know what, boys, we're not done with this match just yet. You think that you have game number three in the back, that you can snowball us? Think again, because we're going to destroy you now. They're gonna try and destroy Urel too. Sundering, they go for Stukov, and Lopaka is deaded. Yeah, talking about momentum. <laughs> Can I just say that I love this series? The entire time it was just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. In game number one, for stretches in game number two, and now in game number three, every single time that you think a team has a lead that is so big that they can't recover, uh, that the opponent can't recover. They just flip the script on its head, turn the game around, and start to kill the entire team. So yeah, really enjoying this. 10 kills to 8, now the fort at the top gets uh, obliterated. And there's a little bit of a difference, of course, with what we're seeing here. All the forts that were destroyed on the red team side were destroyed without the objective. So if you now get your garden terrors, if you get two more seeds, you find yourself in a pretty sexy spot there. But they only have one seed right now. In an ideal world, of course, it wouldn't have had a bit more already. They're 12 minutes in, on the other hand. So, yeah. down at the bottom of the map, everybody is still trying to steal some of those camps away, if they can. Yeah. Trying to make another move for this one right now. So far, hasn't quite worked out. Ice wall. Yeah, no catch. Get some camps at the bottom and at the top lane as everybody is dancing around the camp waiting for the next team fight. There's the taunt, there's the slide, stun follow up, and just no chance for me. They need counter kills. This is what they have to rely upon as everybody uses their cooldowns. They're trying to bring it back, but they're now losing Thrall in the same fight. And this is exactly the problem. They can slide onto Gamer Boy in just a second. Varian is already trying to cut him off over here. They didn't even, don't even need a stun or anything. But now they have two camps at the bottom of the map and can easily break through that wall. But you can see the problem right here. They just crushed everything. They absolutely crushed everything. So now we have still an attack onto the keep. And that one's gone. They're even trying to go for the core here as it seems. I mean, 56,000 damage on Chromie, we have 40, 41,000 for Hanzo. Hanzo is gone, and now the attack towards the core as Team Hirath is... Uh, Team Hirath, Team Lopaka with Hirath is maybe even trying to end it all here. 5 versus 3, right now 18 versus 17, 10 kills to 12. Coming in again with another stun combo, this time against Urel, and Dequaza gets away. No! He gets sniped! The Quasa gets sniped. Damn. That was so clutch. And now they can go for core, essentially. Beautiful plays. Beautiful execution. You gotta give it to the red team. That was quite something. Another five-man wipe as they're totally crushing it. What a performance once more by Team Lopaka. Nicely done. GG and well played.
All right. So. Game number four, Dragonshire, everybody. So, Team Lopaka with a 2-1 lead against Dequaza. Well, we're one map win for the red team short of repeating the exact same score that we had in the previous series. In the first series that the two teams played at the beginning of the group stage. So now, since we're heading into game number four, it also means that 30 heroes are now unavailable. So all of them have already been played and cannot be played again. And <laughs> again, Chogal banned because Team Lopaka likes to play Chogal. And the farther you go in a series, the more heroes have been played already, the more attractive Chogal, of course, becomes as a pick. So they get rid of him immediately. And I gotta give it to uh, the red team. They absolutely crush it. They really do. So awesome performance by them. A fantastic performance on Tumor Spider Queen. They had so much momentum with that killer comp that they executed in game number three then as well. But right now, we still have to double check a little bit. Can they Quasar's team come back? They definitely have the tools. They showed it clearly in game number one. So they could maybe now pull it off here. First of all, Anubarak is being picked first. So he's the first one to uh, join in here. And now we're having the double pick over on the red team side as Lopaka and his boys have to kind of reveal what the thought process is now for the potentially final map of this group, of group A. If they win, they move on together with Banana Age to the final phase of the tournament. If they lose, then of course we're going to fight it out on a fifth and final map between the two teams. Zagara and Malgan is on Dragonshire. And Zagara is but now really a staple on Dragonshire. It's really amusing to me. Now again, part of this has also to do with the fact that we are moving from one map to the next with more heroes being unavailable. But she is still becoming more and more of an option for a lot of the teams here. In the context of the hero pool shrinking a little bit. Now, there is a chance that we're going to get Nidus. There is a chance that they're going to try for a bounty. But again, only a chance. I'm not quite sure if it's really going to happen here. I personally think not because this is such an important match for the two teams. So, yeah. Jungle and Chen get both taken. And with Dragonshire as a map, there's obviously a lot of control elements that also come in since you have to just jump between the lanes and always think, okay, what can we do here? Can we out-rotate the opponent? Are there some globals that we can still play? Can we try and win the game that way? We have seen one game already with Zagara plus Vikings, just to name one particular approach. But as we're heading into the final bans, Karazim gets banned out, which is also interesting. I mean, Karazim again adds the seven-sided strike as another damage tool to you, so if you're starting to get some isolation plays with Chen and maybe a stun with an Uberak, you can really focus the target or the damage on a single target and then, yeah, try and take him out that way. What are we going to get from uh, uh, from Lopaka, though? Is he really going to play Zagara, or is he going to swap that over? Normally he was most of the last pick for the team and then played a bit of an X-Factor hero that was supposed to do a lot of damage and really bring the big plays in. We have Samoro, I like it. So we have now some pressure plays with Samoro, some of the Zagara, get that got Kane. We still need like a more normal hero for Miriale here. And the final double pick also for the blue team, as this is obviously one of, I mean again, De Quasa needs to win two in a row. So this is for all the marbles right now from their perspective. You need to first of all focus on the Dragonshire, win this one no matter what, and then take it a step further with game number five. But we're getting... <laughs> Tracer and Lily. They're actually going for a bounty. They go for the Chen and Lily bounty here. We're getting double panda. <laughs> I did not see that coming at all. They're behind in the series and they go double panda all right <laughs> totally here for it but that comes unexpected they have double overwatch on the other hand so i guess that compensates for it junkrat and tracer and it brings us our final pick for the red team game number four potentially the final map of the group it is match point for team lopaka Final pick for them was Sergeant Hammer, but before we're jumping into that, let's quickly introduce our players on the left for Team Dequaza. We have the double panda in action with Gamer Boy on Lili and Dequaza on Chen. So they are going for a good old bounty attempt with Madaran Junkrat, Drakia and Tracer, 
and Ion is playing a Nuborak. Over on the right side of the map in the meantime, we have Team Lopaka with the Captain on Samuro. We got Hirath on Sergeant Hammer, Hunter Org on Degat Kane, Panax on Malganis, and Miriale is playing Zagara. So, that, <laughs> that looked like a quick int. I was a bit stunned by that. He was trying to hide in the bush, got immediately attacked, and I was like, is he just gonna die? Like, is he AFK? Did he just click and then just like left to uh, get himself some water or whatever? So, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, it's all good for now. But already a bit of an attack with Sergeant Hammer at the top as she's starting to go through the tower. So, yeah, on level one, we got the advanced artillery. And we have for Samuro the way of the wind as they are going for Chen at the bottom of the map. Full on panda power with Team Dequaza. So, once again, they're trying for another bounty here. And interestingly enough, in a mega important game for them, Sergeant Hammer with some sexy jukes over here as well. Nicely done. Dodging out on everything. But Junkrat, of course, still a nuisance when we're talking about Sergeant Hammer. At the bottom of the map, Zagara with real nice damage. And also nicely done by Lopaka and Samuro as they are pushing Chen back. And making sure that Zagara doesn't only survive, but also has a fair amount of spread on this map. I mean, damn, there's like creep everywhere right now. So good vision for her, for sure. And the attack still continues as we have Panax starting to make his way over towards the middle. We still have the rest of the team rotating in with Drakia and Ion, of course, looking for a bit of a kill. Cams are being focused on as well. Lily, by the way, has gone straight into the free drinks. That's my kind of gal right there. So yeah, free drinks sounds like a plan. Tell me where, I'll be there. At the bottom of the map, as we have the mercenary cam, the bruiser cam taken on the left side, it's still all about control over the shrine. The last two times I believe that we were on Dragonshire, we had insanely quick Dragon Knights. It was always at the two minute mark that one of the teams was able to sneak one away. Apparently not so much right here. The attacks, they still keep coming as they're softening up the walls and Sergeant Hammer is just getting full value. Now, as the game continues, we're going to get the top keg barrel place from Chen, all those dives from Nuburak, and then Junkrat with displacement. But for now, at least, the structural damage is solid. So they have a chance to take a Dragonite here, but Tracer's paying attention in the middle of the map. And Malganis, one tower was still standing, was happily firing away against the Dreadlord. But still, able to keep him alive, able to do their thing. Now we're having also the double control Zagara still facing off against Dequaza at the top and of course the camps that we have. She is a bit on the squishy side still, so if Chen starts jumping in here, it could very well be the end of Zagara. They gotta be super careful with that. As uh, Samuro is still being a bit aggressive, was hoping to maybe move back to the middle and get the Dragonite, but with control being wrestled away from Zagara at the top, that was of course not possible anymore. And now they're just pushing even further. I mean, they have both of the camps. Again, the double control on the shrines. And is in a shitty spot because he's going up against two. One of them Zagara, one of them Samuro. Wants to go in for the kill, sees an opportunity, and is about to take it. Gets the kill and is able to get out. Maybe, maybe not. It's, <laughs> it's really close, but he survives. <laughs> Dequaz are just an absolute beast. 2v1 situation and he still finds the window where he can jump in, take Zagara out and then escape without being eliminated himself. So yep, neatly done. One kill to zero. Still the fight at the top though and with Chen now being fully recovered, he's immediately starting to take the fight here. So Parker wants him, the new Barak is diving in, that's the stun once. Can they get more? Ah, Lopaka gets out, Dreadlord has arrived. Zagara busy down at the bottom of the map, so yep, they're all going for it. As the attacks are keep coming one after another. Dirty Trickster on level 7 from Junkrat now. But the entire time, the pressure of the double shrine control by Team Lopaka. So it's a wild one. And now Sergeant Hammer has of course mobility that she was looking for the entire time already. The mobility is finally here. And the Dragonite is taken as a result. They're pressuring too many lanes at once. They couldn't guard the middle. They get at least a kill against the bug at the bottom of the map. But the attack still going strong here. And yep, let's see what happens with the DK. How much damage he can actually do. Dragon's Breath obviously used as a major tool now for the team to take those minion waves out and uh, obliterate the towers and the gate. But at the same time, we're having additional pressure at the top of the map as they're pushing, pushing and pushing. So yeah, neatly done. And of course, in the same attempt, 
still applying pressure in the middle. So it's a two-pronged attack against two forts. But the results are two walls. And to be fair, quite a bit of damage here in the middle, especially with that minion wave. That minion wave is doing a whole lot of work right now on that fort, in addition to what the Dragonite already did. <laughs> They're basically destroying the entire thing. <laughs> yep, they're essentially taking the entire thing out right now. At the top, they've also been pushing, but yeah, good for them. That's really nice progress that they've made here. And Team Dequaza is... I don't really want to say in the pickle or anything just yet, but so far, they, have, they are the ones that have to deal with the pressure. They're not the one applying it. They're the ones that have to try and resist it and break through this as time continues. Both teams now at level 9. So they're closing in on level 10. We've only seen the two kills from the blue team thus far. But it is the blue team as well that is losing most of the structures here. And that will include very quickly the one in the middle. Tracer has lost. That's the first kill actually for Team Lopaka. So yeah, this is looking fairly decent for them right now. And the attack, I mean, it keeps continuing here, right? So at the bottom, for example, we have another tower destroyed. Now they're moving in. They have also as their ults. No Nidus, I'm sorry boys, but we're getting the Devouring more. The Pandas, they're doing their thing here with Lili going full heal, Chen going for the keg. So yeah, a lot of kegs and jugs in uh, in the air now. Sergeant Hammer all alone up at the top and is just getting shot after shot in against the topside forward as they're still fighting here at the bottom of the map. And it's the bottom and the middle that are both super low when we're talking on hit points on uh, their forwards. Whereas up here, Madara is trying to do what he can, but as soon as he moves in, he eats just auto attack after auto attack. <laughs> what a kill by Hiran. <laughs> oh boy, Madara did not see that one coming. Damn, that BFG straight to the face out of hell. Such a cool play there, so well done. And that is the end of Junkrat. The fort in the middle, by the way, that got destroyed. So mid lane fort is already gone. And at the top and at the bottom, I think these two are soon going to be destroyed as well. Two kills to two. Again, the pressure with the dragon. And just look at that amount of, of uh, creep that we have. I mean, Jadon would be proud. This is not bad at all. There's a lot of vision for Miriala right now. Absolutely nothing gets past Zagara. Still, Chen defending the top as best as he can. Another camp has been taken, though. So the mid lane is going to be pressured by a camp in just a few seconds as well. Which is another problem. Now, in addition to that, 20,000 damage by Samuro. He's actually top damage for the team. Even more damage than Sergeant Hammer. Top damage in the game. More than Tracer, more than Junkrat, more than everybody. Zagara now with the control at the bottom of the map, which leads immediately to another chance for Dragonite. Not for long, though, because Dequaza is taking over the top, so they're trying to relieve some pressure here. But while that's happening, Sergeant Hammer has moved in position at the bottom of the map again and has started to take even more of the hit points off. So the attacks keep coming. The rip tire is now coming out. That one went short though. So got interrupted and did nothing. They want to go for Zagara. She gets the heals. Deckard Kane gets stopped. <laughs> and a bit of a problem here with the coordination of the Maw and the BFG. I think they could have taken Tracer out, but instead it's Zagara that falls. Deckard Kane gets also obliterated. He's dead. Samuro at least got value for them moving to the top and taking the fort out. But now he's also channeling in the middle, so there's a Dragonite on top of it. They lost three heroes, but there's two forts that were now destroyed. Samuro has taken the Dragonite. It's more important so that he, uh, so that the, well, it's more important. It's not like he can do an insane amount of damage given the circumstances. Well, if they keep pushing the bottom of the map instead of defending, then maybe he can. But generally speaking, it was also important so that the blue team doesn't pick it up. He might not get the most damage out of this, but as long as he opens up, let's say, the wall in the middle here at the keep, it's already worth it. But it was so much more worth it because he denied it to the red, to the blue team, as they finally got a few kills through and had the upper hand in uh, regards to their, uh, to the numbers on the map. So, real nicely done. Can now move down to the bottom of the map, take another fort out here. So, successful Dragonite. Still a bit of a punt against Gamer Boy in this case, as Lily is trying to run around. She's still looking for adventure here. But we have the 5 versus 5 back up on the map, and this time all 5 are actually fighting down here. So, another big hit, and Ubarak is dead. The BFG came through, they are starting to maw up the next few targets, and the Panda goes down. The entire front line is now destroyed. Tracer is hearthing back as she was trying to rush away, 
and save herself. But oh boy, we are definitely in for a bit of a beating when it comes to the blue team. They gotta break out of this and they gotta break out of it quickly. Or this might be the end of the series. We might get the exact same score that we had the first time that the two teams faced off against each other. Look at that pressure at the bottom of the map now. Samura isn't even here. Samura's at the top. He's pushing the other lane. We got level 16 now, and they got Zagara and Sergeant Hammer pushing for the bottom keep, and it is just melting away. They're just crushing this here. So the rest of the team jumps in. They want to have another kill here. Cocoon against Sergeant Hammer. Bomb against Zagara. Alive a little bit longer, thanks to Degard Kane, but she falls eventually. Samuro has started to rotate down to the bottom of the map, but that's decided to stick it out in the middle instead, as everybody else is just running away. And they're going to get more kills. They're going to get Deckard Kane, and they have a chance of also taking Melganus out. Maybe? Maybe not? I'm talking about taking heroes out. <laughs> BFG again against Chen. And even Anubarak is a bit low. Another stun, though, and he's trying to get away. Melganus! He's escaping? Really? He's actually escaping for just a moment. <laughs> and they saved him. And guess what? Samuro has opened up the wall in the middle in the meantime. So, yeah, they are going for these two pronged attacks time and time again. It's always a fight somewhere. And then either Sergeant Hammer or mostly Samuro now is just pushing the lanes and is doing serious damage. Lopaga gets caught though, and that's bad because this just happened as uh, Deckard Kane came back. So now you have a stack of death at your hands, and yeah, this, this shouldn't have happened. Still, good value for them overall. Problem is that now the objective is also up again, so this is a real opportunity for the blue team to get a Dragonite for themselves. 43,000 damage for Sergeant Hammer, 37,000 for uh, Tracer. And Zagara at this point is just saying, like, alright, I'm just gonna play PvE. I mean, killed in these team fights time and time again. I'm just gonna go for some camp and some minions. Those are easier to take down. Yep, there's the first interrupt against the Nuburak. 10 seconds for uh, Samoro, but this looks very much like Dragonite number one for Team Dequaza. So, here we go. Eight kills to four. 17 to 17. Yep, well done. Question is just simply how much can they get with it? Bottom four, I think, is a given. But besides that, how much more can they do in regards to damage? Because this one's gonna fall. Even defending it would be kind of lazy, so yeah. They're just falling back, and I don't think that the DK is able to do too much. He can dominate the lane a little bit with the Dragon's Breath, but that's about it. So now the move straight up into the middle as the DK is ro rotating around, and again, the problem is Samuro. His side lane pressure that he has over and over again is a bit too much for them to handle. So now he's starting to move in, pushing Madara back, getting nice damage in, okay, and swapping out, retreating from the rest of the team. Dragonite wants to get into range, but they're not, oh well, can they catch him? One stun, two stuns, there comes the rest of the team though, and he's able to escape straight into the hands of Deckard Kane. Another BMG hit out from Sergeant Hammer, as Junkrat is still defending the top. It is just pressure, pressure, pressure. It's always the red team looking for some moves here. So here comes the next attack. Coming in, taking Uberak out. Nicely done, good damage. The Maw is missing, but they're still catching Tracer. Barely with the ult of Deckard Kane. It's not enough to lock her down and kill her though. But they might now with a four versus five be able to siege up at the bottom keep and finally destroy it. Which would of course give them the added catapult pressure that they're really looking for here. So yeah. Hira starting to push out. And again, Samora's immediately back on the side lane. I mean, instantly. And like, yeah, well, we're gonna play this slow, we're gonna play this safe, we're gonna get closer to the level 20. Lopak has to jump out and is able to escape, at least for now. Gets the heals from Deckard Kane as they're already continuing to push at the bottom of the map. 12 seconds for Anubarak. And Sergeant Hammer, with one hit after another, might have to boost out of there. Doesn't even have to yet. Siege tactics, all that's needed. And Dequaza is taking the damage. Damage is coming in. There's another quick hit. Rip tire. And it's not doing enough. It's just not doing enough. And just look how quickly they're now taking that for, uh, that keep out. And we have still some Muro in the middle of the map. Level 20 talents are now available. That gives us Windstrider. That gives us the pack instinct right here. And they're taking the keep out. One keep already gone. Level 20 is in. And they're trying to go for core. Group A might end right here. This could be where the group ends. 
They're pushing using level 20, using the Storm Talons, doing what they can in order to decide this series in their favor. They can focus on the keep in the middle, they can focus on the core, they can switch targets, wait for a kill, play it slow, use that level 20. They're going for Tracer, recall, and yes, she survives. Tracer survives. Lili was looking for adventure and only found death. So did Anubarak. He's dead too. That's two heroes destroyed. They're looking for three. They want the Quasa, and they get the Quasa. And Sergeant Hammer is already on the core, and it looks like the hopes and dreams of the blue team are being squashed right here. This is going to be the end of it. Seems like we're getting another victory for Team Lopaka. They're about to move on to the final round of Banshee Cup season number two together with Team Banana Age. The one, two out of group number A. Sergeant Hammer is dead, but it doesn't matter anymore. It's a win, it's a W, it's a victory. Team Lopaka moves on to the next round of the tournament as Team De Quasa gets eliminated. Thank you everybody for watching the video today. I hope that you enjoyed the show and the commentary. And keep in mind that the spoiler protection that is going to run for the rest of the video is made possible by all the support on Patreon.com. So guys, if you want to support my work, if you want to help me start new projects and keep the spoiler protection in place, please consider heading over to Patreon.com slash Kaldor. There's also a link in the YouTube description and check that out. Thanks in advance and see you guys next time with more esports coverage here on Color TV. Have a great day.